Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, my name is Alex Slackey, Director of Public and Government Affairs for AAA Northeast, uh, and we are delighted to have you on our uh, third uh, episode, I guess, of our transportation reauthorization series. Um, our guest today is, you know, we're very excited to have Beth Osborne. She is the Director of Transportation for America. Uh, she previously was at USDOT, where she served as uh, acting assistant secretary for transportation policy, and she helped uh, implement not the last uh, transportation reauthorization bill, just, just the FAST Act, but even before that, uh, MAP 21. Um, so she's got a lot of experience with transportation reauthorization. So um, I guess w without further ado, Beth, thanks for, for joining us this morning. Thanks so much for having me. We are delighted, and and I guess you know, do you want to take a a minute just to talk about Transportation for America, the organization that that you lead, and and kind of your um your role in the in the federal transportation dialogue? I would be happy to, and I will apologize to everyone for the background noise. My neighbors on both sides are doing huge uh, improvements on their homes, and it uh, results in a lot of noise in my home. Uh, anyway, uh, Transportation for America is a national nonprofit that is focused on creating a transportation system that connects people to jobs and to essential services, no matter their financial means or their physical ability. We do our work through direct technical assistance with those who are trying to achieve the same thing. Uh, we do research and analysis to get a better understanding of where the transportation system is working and where it's not working. And we, based on the, our analysis and our work with uh, those on the ground, uh, identify barriers, develop policies to fix them, and then advocate for those policies. And then we try to help with the implementation. So we, we hopefully go full circle. Great. And and I mean, this is obviously, you know, we, can, we get it every five years or so. I guess this was... Uh, a little bit off off the timeline um, because we had a one year extension last year, but I'm sure very exciting times, um, maybe nerve wracking times a little bit too, because I guess the transportation could either do a lot of good, not so good, so somewhere in the middle. So I guess you know there, there's so much circling with we have the track of the transportation reauthorization, we have the track of the bipartisan infrastructure package and the American Jobs Plan and all that. Um, so I guess, you know, this is maybe a very broad question, but how, how are you feeling about the, the prospects for, um, you know, what your organization is helping for? Yeah, I, I think um, you're right that it is an incredibly busy time. This is, it's actually reasonably in the flow of things. We almost always have an extension of the program for at least a year. Sometimes it goes much longer. Uh, so we're normally talking about transportation reauthorization every six, sometimes seven, maybe even eight years apart. Um, and then it's pandemonium, and then we start the clock again. So this is the pandemonium time. We've got the House considering legislation right this week, the Senate likely to consider something right after the 4th of July recess. We've got negotiations between bipartisan senators and the White House going on at the same time for uh, some uh, additional funding on top of what a regular reauthorization would even do. Um, it's very busy. Uh, I think something you said, Alec, which was, uh, so it, it was actually quite astute and something that is not very well understood by most people working on transportation uh, policy on Capitol Hill. Infrastructure investments can do a lot of good and they can do a lot of harm. There's such a thing as a bad infrastructure project. And so the policy behind that spending, the way we spend that money is the thing that matters to me. Unfortunately on Capitol Hill, and particularly on the Senate side, there seems to be a belief that the number is all that matters and uh, a lack of understanding that money can be spent poorly and to poor outcomes. So I spend most of my life uh, or my, my professional life, convincing people that uh, money can be spent poorly and therefore we should identify when that happens and how to avoid it. And I mean that, you know, I, I think that is something that I really admire about, about you and about Transportation for America is that you are not, 
uh, afraid to call out those uh, those kind of sacred cows. Um, and I know one of the big priorities for your organization, and I think maybe you're the the most prominent organization that's saying this. I don't know if you're necessarily the only one, but talking about um, prioritizing repair and maintenance over new construction, um, because we know we've got an aging infrastructure. That's what everyone, Republicans and Democrats, are talking about, and we need we need to repair it. Uh, you know, first and foremost. And I think, in a lot of the territory that we cover, you know, which is from New Jersey up through Massachusetts, you know, in our dense urban areas, there's not a lot of room. Uh, even our our suburban areas, there's not a lot of room to build new roads maybe even necessarily new lanes. So I guess the question is, how receptive are folks on Capitol Hill to that advocacy for repair over new construction? That's a, it's a great question. Uh, one of our closest partners uh, in this effort is Taxpayers for Common Sense, who has uh, uh, co-authored our report, Repair Priorities, every time we put it out. Um, they recognize that spending money on new infrastructure we know we can't afford to maintain while not maintaining what we have is uh, is not good policy. It's not uh, a good use of taxpayer dollars. So uh, we do have uh, a, you know a good understanding across the, uh, uh, the, the the political spectrum on why it's not wise. Um, in terms of receptivity on Capitol Hill, um, the the house uh has included some really great language on this in their bill the invest act they just have language that says uh if you're going to build something new or you're going to expand something you should have a plan to maintain it throughout its useful life and you should be making progress on your repair goals that's it, it when, when you say it out loud the first response should be you mean we don't do that? Mm -hmm. um, but the response actually is often that that is radical. The notion that you should have a plan to maintain what you're building is radical. The notion that you should uh, be making progress on your backlog while you're building new things is radical. Um, so we're very excited to see the House uh, uh, include that language. It was actually strengthened by a bipartisan amendment last year, though a lot of the, it was uh, unanimously adopted, though uh, it became partisan this year. Apparently uh, the Republicans feel that maintaining what we have before building new stuff is, uh, is not giving the states enough flexibility, presumably to not take care of what we have. Um, and in the Senate, uh, they also talk about flexibility, but no one finishes that sentence. You know, flexibility to dot, 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 to not maintain what we have while we build new things we can't afford to maintain. Um, I find when you finish the sentence, there's great discomfort in that notion of flexibility over accountability uh, and, and overall good stewardship of uh, the assets. But too often in the Senate, that sentence is never completed. So um, there is bipartisan lack of receptivity there because they think the deal is in not having that accountability. I mean, is there a, a way to kind of, I guess, square that circle and saying like, we want to give states flexibility, like we don't want to tie them down with regulation after regulation, but we also, we, you know, we do want to hold them accountable and we want them to, you know, be doing good things with the, the money that, that the feds are sending down to them. Are there any like particular reforms or I guess, um, you know, ways that we could hold them accountable while still trying to, you know, be receptive to the their need for flexibility? I don't know how the language in the house doesn't supply flexibility. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is have a system to maintain what you're building. Yeah. That's it. Like how you do that's up to you. You need to be making progress on your backlog. How you do that is up to you. But at some point, we just have to have an honest conversation in government. We are either going to address the repair backlog, or we're in favor of flexibility. The two don't go together. Mm -hmm. And we just have to make a decision as a, as a nation about what we truly care about. But you can't say we're going to spend money to fix our crumbling roads and bridges, but we're going to do it by sending money that you can do whatever you want with, recognizing that it is often easier to build the new thing 
than to shut down an existing road to repair an old thing. Mm -hmm. We just have to recognize that there are choices and make our choice. Same thing in safety. You know, I, there's an argument the House has language that says that states are not permitted anymore to set targets for there to be more fatalities on roadways. Now, again, that's radical in our existing environment. I personally think that that's a pretty basic concept that should be obvious. Uh, but right now, a state could say 800 people were killed on our roadways last year, and our target this year is 825. Now, what's actually happening is states are setting, they're looking at the trends, and they're marking the trend rather than trying to bend it. Um, and at the, at the House, they're saying, you can't do that. You've got to actually attempt to bend that and improve your safety results. In the Senate, the position is the states need flexibility. And I would ask the states need the flexibility to have more people die on their roadways. Look, we got to choose. Are we in favor of improving the uh, safety performance of our roadways? Or are we in favor of flexibility for them to set other priorities other than safety? Pretty clear choice, and we just have to pick. To date, we picked flexibility and not safety or repair, and that's why more people are dying on our roads, particularly vulnerable users, and our repair backlog isn't budging. That's, I mean, that's a, a kind of a great segue, I think, in, into the next kind of question that I had prepared, which is the, um, I guess, the balance between highway and transit split because it's kind of historically been 80 20 and you know we know in the northeast i mean we talk about safety and we talk about what that you know that means for you know the laws on our roadways and enforcement and engineering but i think you know i think we do have generally better than average traffic safety laws in the northeast but we also have a lot higher transit mode share particularly in um in new york city and the suburbs in boston as well um, which helps, you know, keep people off the roads. And if you talk about fatalities per capita, that is a big contributor to it. Um, so I guess, you know, we, we hear Amtrak Joe, Joe's a, a rail guy. What are the prospects for changing that 80-20 split um, in reauthorization? So that that is a priority of ours. You know, our priorities are um, to to, to uh, have a fix it first strategy, to address safety and make it a priority over the speedy movement of vehicles, and to organize our program around getting people to jobs and essential services, whether they drive or not. We can actually measure the efficiency and the performance of our transportation system on that basis, no matter how people travel now, thanks to not even very new technology, and we wanna see that implemented. That's also in the House bill, by the way. Um, and there's a pilot to do it in the Senate bill. Um, and, and having a highway style investment in transit would show a commitment to transit like we have shown to, the, to building out the highway system. Um, the deal we have for transit right now, of course, as, at the 20% mark is based on a deal we struck in 1982, just yesterday. Uh, I would argue that things are a little different and our needs might be a little different than they were in 1982 but we, we stick by that tradition. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that there is uh, some likelihood that it will move. Um, I don't think it will move to a highway style commitment. In fact, it was rather disappointing to see the administration talking about how their bipartisan deal represents a historic investment in transit um, because it is more than our current very small investment in transit. I mean, it's, my first response to that was, uh, low bar. Um, but also, it's a historic investment in highways. Everything was growing. So yes, yes, we're spending more. In every reauthorization, we spend more. My question is about the system. So while here in DC, we're able to pretend that the, the highway program and the transit program are different things, those of us that actually move around as citizens in this country know that they're not in reality and physical form. For me to get to transit, I have to walk on the road system. Now, luckily, I live in the middle of Washington, D.C., where I have nice wide sidewalks that connect me very and, and frequent crossings and slow moving traffic, so I can easily reach that transit. But in most of America, that's not the case. 
because the priority is to move cars quickly. So to reach that transit, sometimes you have to dart across quite dangerous traffic in order to reach it. And uh, then we say that people don't choose to do that. Again, in DC, they, they like their little constructs. We like to pretend that the transit program is a creature unto itself. We like to pretend that the transportation program is a creature under, unto itself and not reliant on the built environment around it. The reason that Northeast has such good uh, transit and, and walking and biking split is because it was built before the car and mm -hmm. trips are short and the things you need are clustered together. And uh, the rest of, uh, so much of the rest of the United States was built in a way that put everything we need so far away from where we live and so far from away from each other that we have created a structure that can create maximum congestion and expense with the fewest number of people. And then we use that as an excuse to just build lots more of it. And we just keep getting the same results. So I, I think you raise a lot of good issues there. Um, and using a, an access to jobs and essential services measure can help those localities understand that interplay between the modes and between transportation and the development around it. And I, I mean, I think, you know, talking about the roads interfering with the built environment, I think we know uh, you, you mentioned earlier that transportation projects aren't always good. They can cause harm. And I think that's been a lot of conversation in circles about um, highway teardowns and we see um, things like the Sheridan Expressway in New York City in the Bronx that's that was a high profile one we have up in Syracuse and in Hartford discussions about um, these sorts of projects and I know that there was some large pot of money in the American Jobs Plan 20 billion I think that would have gone to these sorts of um, I don't think it was explicitly highway teardowns, but community reinvestment. Um, and I know that that number has been scaled drastically back in the bipartisan bill. And then there's parallel tracks for the uh, reauthorization bill. So what, what's your sense about where that, you know, that money might come from or the level of investment in those sorts of projects that, that might be out there? Yeah, and you know, I grew up in New Orleans. So, uh, and when I was at USD DOT, we funded a planning effort looking at taking down the Claiborne Expressway, uh, which goes straight through a beautiful community called Treme, which some people uh, became familiar with thanks to an HBO series. Um, and it, it is every bit as beautiful as that series makes it out to be, both in architecture and and in community. Um, but that uh, that highway, the monster, is uh, uh, it really did destroy the corridor, and it really did create a, a massive separation between the the two sides of the neighborhood. Um, so we, we're looking at things like that uh, and taking it down. We're looking at things like bridging over highways, and it's not necessarily a takedown. But I know in the Rondo neighborhood of St. Paul, they're looking at a bridge over the highway. So there's lots that can be done. But in both the Sheridan and the Claiborne Expressway, some of the things that we found out was our current tools aren't up to the task. You know, our models are really rudimentary. They were the best we had in the 1950s, but we, uh, we took the best we had in the 1950s and we etched them into, um, you know, scrolls and, and, and made them biblical in, in their power. We, we just have not done enough to update them. Um, the, the current Federal Highways Administrator, uh, Stephanie Pollack, who used to be the DOT Secretary in Massachusetts, says, you know, one of the, the number one things that those models can't measure is the trip not taken, which was all the trips last year, <laughs> so many of the trips last year. It can't measure when you choose to telecommute or you choose a telehealth appointment or you order things as opposed to going to the store. And that's a huge amount of commerce right now. It can't measure uh, that you might choose not to stay in the corridor. In fact, the models are constructed in a way that don't allow trips to leave the corridor. They assume that if you take that highway down that everyone will just squeeze onto it no matter how bad it gets. That no human would think, maybe I should try someplace else or maybe I should try a different time of day. Model can't tell that. Or um, they can't tell that you'd shift modes. They in fact, claim that the person who was going 55 miles per hour on the highway would choose instead 
to go into a disconnected local roadway network and in new orleans it's not a particularly well maintained one and and brave massive potholes because the traffic slows down on the highway or because or on the new boulevard all of this is illogical but it's it's just a program it's just an excel spreadsheet that can only do what the the people who created it asked for it to do so it's we need to give people tools that actually show what truly happens every time a highways come down the armageddon that people claim would occur never occurs and yet we still follow that that uh projection as if it's sacrosanct um and and i think that not just looking at taking down highways or bridging highways or reconnecting communities is important it's making sure that in doing so we will inevitably in unlock massive value in that land we cannot allow that to dislocate the communities a second time mm -hmm. so we need money not just to come in and fix the infrastructure we have to come in and protect the community and the affordability at the same time and i don't know that you can do that with one billion dollars over eight years yeah, it did seem like a pretty small small sum for all the different projects over the over the entire country. Um, but I guess you know, a, a kind of an inside baseball question, maybe based on your your background at, at working at DOT. When these reauthorization packages are being negotiated, you know, Congress can get a little bit territorial. Like they they want their authority respected. Um, they don't want the executive branch running roughshod over them. So you got the House track, you've got the Senate track. How involved is, you know, the Biden administration? I mean, that, I guess really more of a retrospective question. How involved were were uh, was the Obama administration and in particular the folks at DOT um, in negotiating that reauthorization package? That's a, a, a great question uh, i think that the the team i was involved with was um what we we really made a mistake we were not involved um we we were in many ways held back from the white house from being involved and and uh that was to our detriment i think it's why we accomplished so little legislatively we passed two bills that didn't get us any closer to really any of our goals um and that was unfortunate i do see the biden team uh much more engaged they're not being dictatorial about it but they are available for um for assistance and helping to write language and when when folks come with uh thoughts and ideas and helping to form it and that's good that's that's a very important role to play it's uh, one of the most powerful roles they have right now um and right now they've got a bipartisan agreement out there um which is very it, it's it's like an outline it, it's like the first set of ideas um but there's a lot more work to do in in turning that into something that would actually be legislation and so their involvement in these reauthorization proposals will be important to put some meat on the bones a list of words and a list of numbers next to them is not policy um it's it, it might be the basis to start a conversation about policy but um but right now we just have a bunch of numbers. So um, I think that they need to stay very engaged and to think about how the, the numbers that they've created will impact the outcomes that we all claim to care about, like safety and repair. Because if it's a big number being spent in a way that will undermine it, then what kind of a deal do we have? On the other hand, if it's a big number that will get us to move forward in that direction that we we uh, we say that we want to move in, then it's a wonderful agreement. Yeah, and and we have a, a kind of a question from from the audience along those lines. You, you know, we have the House Senate package, or sorry, we have the House package, and we have the Senate package. They're moving in these parallel tracks. How do those negotiations normally go when they're being merged? Because they are, you know, they are quite different right now. Yeah, um, it's going to be really interesting to see how it goes. I mean, I've I've been in on um, some of those negotiations in the past. Uh, I was part of the conference of the Recovery Act and of Safety Lou and of a Water Resources and Development Act along the way, and um, they all go very very differently. Uh, and the level of involvement from the White House can be quite different in them as well. Um, so it's hard to predict. Um, uh, both sides really need to sit down and figure out what is the 
you know, what are the most important things they need to keep in the bill in order to come to agreement and work through those. Um, there will be a lot of arguments in the weeds, but uh, the, the big fights need to be limited. And so figuring out what really matters to people is what will, will be important. Um, my, my issue with the Senate bill is they follow the very traditional structure of identifying a problem um, like repair and creating a program to repair things while spending a much bigger amount of money to not repair things, to build new things that they can't afford to repair. You know, it's like an excavator build a, you know, digging a huge hole and then uh, refilling it with a teaspoon and calling that reform. And uh, they do this in resilience too. They say that we need, uh, we have a big program to, uh, to improve resilience, but if uh, a road, for example, washes out due to a flood, you don't have to use emergency funds to build it back more resilient. Why? Why? How, how is that good stewardship? I don't understand. I don't understand how that helps resilience or accountability or is a good use of taxpayer dollars. I don't see how that furthers Republican or Democratic ideals. The, the House, on the other hand, tries to create the full circle. Let's repair past problems. Let's stop creating those problems. And I'm hoping they can find a way across uh, House and Senate, Republican and Democrat, to at least get to that approach. Because uh, again, I don't know how you stand in front of the taxpayer and say, I want to use your money to fix a handful of things while making a whole bunch of new problems. They, they, I, I'd love to find the voter that thinks that that's a good use of their money. Well, I think that's a that's a perfect way to to end it. I know we're just at uh, 11.30 and uh, great, great conversation really interesting perspective and if you want to learn more about transportation for america and their positions you can go to t the number four uh, america.org um and we will be sending out a recording of this um, webinar so any folks that um might have missed it or um, any of your colleagues that you think might be interested definitely feel free to share with them um and with that uh, we uh we want to thank beth uh, for joining us and uh, thank all the, the folks in the audience for joining us as well. Um, and, you know, good, good luck, Beth, as, uh, as the reauthorization uh, continues to heat up in July. And I'm, I'm sure uh, hopefully, you know, come the, come the fall, at least you'll be able to take a breath a little bit. I, from, from, from your lips to God's ears. I hope so too. <laughs> all right. Take care, everyone. Take care.